All right, we're in the book of Zechariah tonight. If you want to open your Bibles there, we're going to start in uh, chapter 1 of Zechariah and read a couple of verses and then go back for just a little bit to the book of Ezra to kind of um, set the stage and to talk about you know the, the context of what was happening with Zechariah in his life and, of course, with the nation of Israel. So I want to start just by reading the first few verses of this chapter. It says, In the eighth month... In the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying, The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Then he says, Be not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I command my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us, according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. And this passage is uh, a passage about, uh, you know, about repentance. Ultimately, it's God calling them to repentance, but it also teaches us some important principles and lessons about God and his word and how he works through his word and how his word um, has power and life in it. So to understand, we want to talk just a little bit about the, the background of Zechariah. And we did a little bit of this last time with, um, with Haggai. But we're talking about the return from captivity. So God's people had been in captivity for 70 years. And, and now Cyrus has issued the decree to allow them to return. So in the year 536 B.C., almost 50,000 of the children of Israel returned to their homeland from Babylon. And so that's you know, a pretty big number. Um, in comparison to the population of the children of Israel, it's not as big probably as it should have been, but still 50,000, you know, that's a, that's a lot of people coming back. And so they came back to the land, and after their first winter in Judah, they started working on rebuilding the temple, which we talked about with um, Haggai last time. Their enemies opposed them, and they stopped uh, working on the temple and began working on their own houses. And that's when God sent Haggai and Zechariah to preach to them. And Haggai, of course, showed us that um, they said it was time for them to build their houses, but not time to build God's house. And God reprimanded them for not having their heart uh, in, in what was right. First of all, not putting God in his house first. And then secondly, even when they started working on the temple, they weren't doing it with the right heart and the right motivation. So Haggai dealt with that aspect um, of it. Zechariah comes along at the same time and deals, the message is, is kind of similar. You know, it has the same um, thrust to it, but from a, a very different perspective. So I want us to read a few verses in Ezra chapter 1 to, to remind us of three very important facts about not just the captivity, but about the return from captivity. And the first thing is in Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 tell us about Cyrus issuing the decree to allow them to come home. And verse 3 says this, Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts beside the freewill offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. And what we learn there, and it's important to know this and, and to remember it, is that the return from captivity was entirely voluntary. Cyrus didn't say, you must go back to your homeland. He said, if you want to, you can. And so the return was up to them. And that's important because, of course, you would think 
that every child of Israel who had been taken captive would be excited about this opportunity and couldn't wait to get back to their homeland, but in fact, only 50,000 did, about 50,000. And so nobody was forced by Cyrus to return to Judah, and more importantly, no, no Israelite was forced by God to return to Judah. So everyone who came back to Jerusalem and back to Judah came of their own free will. And again, we have to remember that because that means these are the people. Uh, you know, you talk about the faithful remnant, the Bible does. Uh, we talk about sometimes the cream of the crop. These are the people who understood that God doesn't want us to be in Babylon. We're supposed to be in Judah and Jerusalem, and we're supposed to rebuild his house, and we're supposed to continue this bloodline for the Messiah to come. Those who understood that went back. Those who didn't understand or didn't care stayed where they were. They had become accustomed to Babylon, and many of them seemed to like life in Babylon better than life you know, in, in Jerusalem. And there's an important spiritual lesson there, of course. Babylon in the Bible is often used to symbolize the world. And it's very often the case that even many who are Christians, many who have come out of the world and obeyed the gospel, become comfortable again with the world. And they become content, and not just content, but they like better living in the world than living in the church. They get tired of, you know, giving up things of, of the sinful nature that the world says are okay. And so they're content to be worldly. And, and sometimes they just outright leave the church. And sometimes they keep attending and, you know, have their place in the assembly. But their hearts are still in the world. So these who came back were those who understood the importance of going back to Jerusalem. The second thing we learned from Ezra is in chapter 2 that the return from captivity, number one, it was voluntary. Number two, it was individual. So if you notice in verse one of chapter two of Ezra, it says, now these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away unto Babylon and came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, everyone unto his city. And then he starts to list them down at verse 3, the children of Parosh, 2,000, 170, and, two, and then he goes through the list. And sometimes these passages in the Bible, we wonder, why does God give us these? Well, one of the reasons for this list is that God is showing who the faithful were, the ones who chose to come back, but he's also showing that it was an individual choice. choice. So you have these people listed here. Verse 7, for example, says the children of Elam, 1,254. Well, that doesn't mean that there were only 1,254 children of Elam, but out of all the children of Elam, Elam, these are the ones who chose to come back. So it was voluntary, and it was individual. So one member of the tribe, the head of the tribe, for example, if he chose to come back, that didn't automatically mean that everybody in that tribe had to come back. And those who didn't, of course, didn't get credit for coming back because one of the tribe did. So I hope we understand the point that it's just like, you know, salvation. When God calls us out of the world to, to leave the world and be become a Christian is voluntary. We make that choice, but it's also an individual choice. No one can be saved for us. I don't get to go to heaven just because my parents were Christians, right? I have to make that choice. It's an individual responsibility. My children can't ride my coattails to heaven. They have to make that choice. And we don't control those choices. Hopefully, we can influence them and guide them and teach them so they have the information to make the right choice. But ultimately, every person makes his or her own decision about salvation, and that was also true with the captivity. So there's been um, a, an, an emphasis on this in the book of Ezekiel. And, you know, we talked a little bit about Ezekiel and about his saying that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. But Ezekiel strongly emphasizes throughout his book individual choice, preparing for this opportunity to come back. 
you're going to have to decide to do that on your own. Now, another important lesson to learn from that is that God never intended a national salvation of Israel. We hear that so many times in the religious world today that because you were a, a, you know, a citizen of the nation of Israel, then you were automatically saved. And God is going to bring the Israelites back to Jerusalem and Jesus is going to come back and reestablish a kingdom there because all Israel shall be saved, Paul said in Romans. But Paul didn't say all Israel shall be saved. He said, and so all Israel shall be saved. And he means, by so, he means in like manner that Israel can be saved just like the Gentiles are saved by the gospel. So God never uh, designed a national salvation. It's true the nation of Israel, they were his people, but salvation was always individual, and it still is today. And Romans 9, 1 through 16 shows that clearly. So everybody who returned made an individual choice to do that, unless you were a child, you know, and your parents brought you, but, you know, someone who was an adult. So the return was voluntary, the return was individual, and in the third place, the return from captivity was spiritual. And we need to remember that. The purpose of the return was to rebuild the temple. In verse 2 of Ezra 1, it says, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. And so Cyrus says that God wants me to send you back home so you can build his house. And we saw that in verse 3, go back and build God's house uh, there in Jerusalem. One more time in verse 5, then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And so ultimately this is a spiritual goal. Now, obviously, there's physical labor involved in building a temple, but the purpose is spiritual. And so they weren't coming back just to live in the land where their parents lived and, you know, to remember things from their childhood. They were coming back for a spiritual reason because God had chosen that place for his house and their responsibility was to be faithful to God. So it was a spiritual uh, return. Also, um, those who did not return did not return for spiritual reasons, okay? There's, there's not going to be a, a further human king over Israel. We, we read about Zerubbabel uh, in Ezra and Nehemiah, but also in the prophets in Haggai and Zechariah. And Zerubbabel was a governor, and he was a governor under the authority of Cyrus, and so even though he's going to have, you know, this, this position of authority in, in Judah, ultimately he still answers to the king of Persia. Zerubbabel was of the lineage of David, which of course is pointing to the true king, which is Jesus. And there are prophecies in Zechariah that um, show that. And so the goal was to return to build the temple and... They, they needed to have that spiritual goal first. And so they're, they're not returning, you know, purely for social reasons. This wasn't some kind of rebellion against Persia that we're not going to be ruled by you and so we're going to claim our freedom. Uh, again, the king of Persia gave them the right to do this. And also if you look at Ezra 3 and verse 7, it says they gave money also unto the masons and to the carpenters and meat and drink and oil unto them of Zidon and to them of Tyre to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the Sea of Joppa according to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. And so he not only allowed them to go, but he gave them a grant of money to be able to purchase materials for the building of the temple. Also in chapter 4 and verse 3, But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. So they're not rebelling against Persia. They're not trying to overthrow the Persian government. They had permission to lead. So this was not 
you know, a fight for some kind of social freedom. It wasn't a social return. Uh, in, in fact, they're going to be servants of, of Persia, Greece, and then Rome, all the way until their fall in A.D. 70. So they're never really going to be free again, and they're not going to be kings again until Jesus comes. So the point is that the cause of the return was a moral one and a spiritual one to rebuild the temple and restore true worship, which is what Zerubbabel and Jeshua were doing. Zerubbabel's the governor, Jeshua's the high priest. Their goal was to rebuild the people and to restore their morality. And that's what Ezra, the priest, does. He spends his life teaching them God's law so that they won't go into sin and fall into captivity again. And then their goal was to rebuild the walls, which would restore security. And that's what Nehemiah oversees. So it's all about restoration, restoring the temple and true worship, restoring the people and their morality, and then restoring the walls and the security of Jerusalem. And so that was the purpose of it. And then in chapter 3 and verse 1 of Ezra, it says, When the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. And so we learned that the return was unifying. It brought the people together as, as one. And so all those who came back were devoted to the same purpose and the same cause to rebuild the temple and to restore those things. And with that kind of unity, they could work together and accomplish God's will and his purpose. And then one last thing in verse 2 of chapter 3, it says, Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josedek, and his brethren the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. The return from captivity was restorative. The goal was a restoration to get back to doing things the way that it was written in the law. And here it's the law of Moses who's called the man of God. And so they had drifted from what God said in his law. For a long time they had drifted from it when they were in Judah and Jerusalem. They hadn't been obedient to it. And now when they're taken away in captivity, obviously they can't be obedient to it. They couldn't go to worship at the temple and those things. And so the goal of them coming back was to restore God's order for things. And that's, you know, necessary to, uh, to keep in mind. And there are a lot of other verses that talk about that. So they're trying to go back to the word of God. They're trying to return to the religion of God. They're trying to, once again, be the nation of God. And the importance of that is to show us what this return was all about, that it was more than just these people coming home, but there was a spiritual and a moral purpose behind it, and also to show that the doctrine of premillennialism is entirely false. They completely miss what the return was about and say that it didn't happen then, so it has to happen in the future when it's already taken place. They talk about the ten lost tribes of Israel because the northern kingdom went into captivity you know, before the southern kingdom of Judah. And they say those ten tribes were just lost. We don't know what happened to them. Well, they need to read Exodus 2 because he, I'm sorry, Ezra 2, because he tells us all of these people who came back weren't just from Judah, but they were from all 12 tribes of Israel. We know where the ten lost tribes went. Some of them stayed in captivity, some of them came back to Jerusalem, along with the faithful of Judah and Benjamin and, of course, the tribe of Levi. So the captivity was, was to punish, but also to create this attitude of a desire for restoration. And so the return was a restoration movement. And it was entirely voluntary. It was individual. It was spiritual. But it also served to unite them and then to restore all those things that they had lost. Well, that's where Zechariah comes in. So back to chapter 1 of Zechariah, we, we learn some things about um, him. First of all, his name means Jehovah has remembered. And so the name implies, of course, 
that God didn't forget them while they were in captivity, but he remembered them, and not only remembered them, but he remembered them in the sense of allowing them now to come back home. So the very name of Zechariah is reminding them that God remembered them, and he didn't uh, forget them. He's the son of Berechiah and the grandson of uh, Ido or Ido, and we read that also in Ezra 5 and verse number 1. From uh, Nehemiah 12, we learn that he is not just a prophet, but he's also a priest. And then from uh, here in chapter 1 and verse 1, in the eighth month, the second year of Darius, uh, we learn that he began prophesying two months after Haggai. So Haggai prophesied for two months, and then Zechariah began his work. So the book of Zechariah, and one of the reasons I wanted to do this is to, to talk about how this book is written and it's presented. It divides into two sections. You have chapters 1 through 8, which is contemporary with Haggai. So while Haggai is preaching what's in Haggai 1 and 2, Zechariah is preaching what's in Zechariah 1 through 8. So those are at the same time, and the focus is on rebuilding the temple. But chapters 9 through 14 of Zechariah, they're not dated. We don't know exactly when they were written. We know they were written by Zechariah. The language and the style and everything is the same throughout the book. But we're not given dates like we are here in the beginning. But those chapters look past where they are in the present, look forward to the time of Jesus. So the last chapters, 9 through 14, are filled with prophecies about Christ and about his coming. And in our series on Sunday nights, we're going to look at some of those a little later on and uh, you know, see how those prophecies were, were given. So the message of Haggai was simple and it was practical. God said, consider your ways, think about what you're doing and why you're doing it or not doing it, and then build the temple. So consider your ways and build the temple. That's what Haggai's message was. Zechariah has the same message, basically, but the style is very different from uh, Haggai. And so there's a lot of symbolic language and apocalyptic language and visions rather than just a straightforward you know, preaching like, like Haggai did. So the book of Zechariah is um, probably one of the most misused in the religious world to try to justify premillennialism. But when you understand the purpose of it and you understand the background of it, then the teachings, even in these visions and this symbolic language, they're actually very clear. When you think about what's going on, you can understand clearly what he's uh, talking about. So this book is the bridge uh, between the nation of Israel before captivity and the nation of Israel after and so he writes about the former prophets. We read that in verse 4 of chapter 1, where he talked about the former prophets and what they did. He does it again in chapter 7 and again in chapter 12. Those are the prophets who tried to, to preach to the people before captivity and tried to show them the error of their ways and to get them to repent so they wouldn't go into captivity. And so he focuses on them to tell the people God tried, and we didn't listen. And so he gave us exactly what he promised. We were punished. And then the bridge is, he begins to say, that's what we did then. What are we going to do now? Are we going to learn from our mistakes, learn from our past, learn from our forefathers and, and their sins, and do differently? Or are we going to follow their example? So he reflects upon those prophets and those prophecies in light of captivity, and then he carries them forward to the time of Christ. So he becomes a bridge between the nation before and the nation after captivity, and then connects it to Jesus. He also has the purpose of showing that what those former prophets said was absolutely true, that everything that they foretold and that they promised was exactly right. And God did exactly what he said he would do through those prophets. And then he gives us a picture of the coming Messiah as a prophet, chapter 1 and verse 6, as a priest in chapter 3, verse 1 and verse 8, and then as a king. 
in chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. So he shows Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. And so it's an important transition from the captivity to the return and then ultimately to the New Testament. So some of the things in the book you know, go all the way forward to the time of Christ. So we read these first six verses uh, here in Zechariah 1. Let's talk about this um, call to repentance uh, because it is kind of you know, the foundation of everything that follows in the book is built on his um, plea with them to not make the same mistakes that their forefathers made. So he begins, as we said, about two months after um, Haggai, and his first message is that they need to repent of their sins. So in verse 2 he said, The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. And we understand that, that God had tried to preach and to teach his people before captivity not to, to do what they were doing or they were going to suffer. And so he was sore displeased, and he allowed them then to go into captivity. And so verse 3 says, Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. And that's a very simple principle, but it's so hard sometimes for people to, um, not necessarily to grasp, but to live by. That God says, if you want me on your side, you have to be on my side. If you will turn away from sin and turn away from the world and turn away from anything you know, that's not me and turn to me, then I will turn to you. Which shows us that if we don't turn to God, he doesn't turn to us. right? So if we want God to hear our prayers, we have to be faithful to God. If we want God to bless us, we have to be faithful to God. If we want you know, the good things of God, we have a responsibility to turn to him. And if we willfully rebel against him, then God doesn't owe us anything, right? So we want him to turn to us, we have to turn to him. And instead of holding true to those principles of restoration, they were starting to act like their fathers. Instead of trying to go back to what the word of God said, and to build the temple and to you know, establish his religion and, and all the practices of it and the morality of it, they were turning away from those principles just like their fathers had done. And Zechariah reminds them God was not pleased with that. So turn to me and I will turn to you. Now verse 4, he reminds them very specifically here, be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. And by the way, notice that, that statement um, in verse 3. This is what he was to say. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, turn you unto me. And then again, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Three times in that verse, verse 4 says that the prophets said, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. The end of verse 4, saith the Lord. And it goes on and on. And you see it again in verse number 6. Over and over he's saying, this is the word of God. This is what God said. And if we want God to be with us, we have to listen to what he says. So the former prophets cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. And so the former prophets had made that plea with God's people. And I want to read it just real quick, uh, you know, for the sake of completion here. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 18 says, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And so God's prophet was given God's words, and that's what he spoke, and they were to listen and not just hear it, but to submit to it and to obey to it. But they refused. They refused to listen to the words of the prophets, which were, in fact, the words of God. Over in uh, 1 Samuel, let's say chapter 3 and verse number 10, we have a similar um, statement made here about inspiration and the words of the prophets. But it says this, And the Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak. For thy servant heareth. So 
I'm willing to listen. So God speak, which is what God did through the prophets. And the attitude of Samuel should have been the attitude of every child of Israel. Whatever God says, that's what we'll listen to, and then that's what we'll do. And so that's the principle that he's teaching here. I want to read one more verse in connection with this from uh, Jeremiah. We'll go to Jeremiah 11, beginning in verse number, let's see, verse number 6. It says this, Then said the Lord unto me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant, and do them. For I earnestly protested unto your fathers in the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day, rising early and protesting, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they obeyed not, nor inclined the ear, but walked every one in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. And so Jeremiah says that God tried over and over again to warn them, and all he asked was, Obey me, do what my word says. But because they didn't listen and because they didn't obey, that's why captivity came. And Zechariah is reminding him of them of that. We just came out of 70 years of captivity, finally able to come back home, but we were there because we didn't listen to God. And now here we are in the land, and you're not listening to God again. You're not building God's house, you're building your own house. Are we going to do this again and go into captivity again and make God punish us again? Or are we going to repent so he says in verse 5, your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? And so their fathers obviously had gone into captivity. Where were they? They were in Babylon. Uh, many of them had died there. But also for you know, generations, they had died in disobedience to God. What about the prophets? Do they live forever? No. They were dead. Those prophets died just like all men do. But, he says, my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? So the prophets died, but the word didn't die because it wasn't just the word of Moses or of Samuel or of any of these other prophets that we've talked about. It was the word of God. And he asked, did that word take hold of your fathers? And they said, or the answer is, they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us, according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. And so Zechariah says, you know, why did we go into captivity? And they say, because God did what he said he would do. It wasn't his fault. It was our fault. We didn't listen. We didn't obey. And so God, who had warned us for hundreds of years what would happen, now it's come to pass. We need to learn from that, of course, that all of the teachings in Scripture and even in the New Testament about the day of judgment and the fact that Jesus is going to return and when he does, we're going to stand before him and either be saved eternally in heaven or condemned eternally to hell is absolutely true. And no matter how many people try to say it's a myth or it's just a story, no matter how many people reject it and disobey God and say, that's never going to happen. One day, it will happen. The children of Israel thought God will never put us into captivity. He loves us too much. Jerusalem is his hometown. The temple is his house. God will never allow it to be destroyed, but it was destroyed. And the message is, he'll do it again if we don't repent. And he'll do it again, of course, at the end of time and destroy the whole thing, the entire universe and we'll be either saved or lost forever. So they needed to learn the lesson of the past, that God means what he says, and he always keeps his word. And so they needed to repent, and they needed to obey God. And that's the foundation of what Zechariah is about. And that message is going to be presented in visions and symbolism and all kinds of things, but that's the heart of the message, that we need to take God at his word, and, and trust and obey him and do what he says and everything will be okay. And if not, we're going to be punished. And so we'll have another lesson on, on Zechariah. We, we may do it next time or I may put Malachi in between. But 
I want to talk a little bit about some of these visions that he has in the first chapters here and how that you know, plays out and is related to, uh, to the message here. But we'll, we're out of time, so we'll stop here, and uh, we'll pick up with this part uh, either next time or in the following lesson, but we'll talk about this other aspect of Zechariah. One twenty five will be our song of invitation. If you want to get a song book, can open there. Number one hundred twenty five. We'll sing that in just a few moments. In our Bible class, we were studying from uh, the book of Zechariah, really more from Ezra, but kind of laying the foundation for uh, for Zechariah as a prophet. And we noted the first six verses of chapter one, which is a call to repentance, and the way that Zechariah issues this call is to remind the people they just came out of captivity. They'd been captive for 70 years in Babylon, and they've finally been able to come home, and now it's time to rebuild the temple, and they stopped doing that. And, you know, so many times that, that's how it is. God blesses us abundantly. We come out of the world and into salvation in Christ and his church, and before you know it, uh, we're back in the world doing worldly things. We forget all of the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. We let the world, you know, get in the way and distract us. And, and like the children of Israel, we stop doing what we're supposed to be doing. And Zechariah says to them, the former prophets cried. They cried out God's word. And they told you, turn from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me saith the Lord. And what Zechariah is doing is asking them a question. He says, you know what, what happened. God said, do this. His people didn't do that. God said, don't do this. Don't worship idols and all those other things. And that's what they did. And he promised that if they did those things, they would go into captivity. And guess what? We went into captivity. And we were there for 70 years. And the city was destroyed, and the walls were destroyed, and the temple was destroyed. And God, in his mercy, has allowed us to come back and given us a second chance. And we're doing the same things that our fathers did. We're not listening. We're not obeying. So Zechariah says, what are we going to do? Are we going to keep not listening to God and disobeying him? Or are we going to learn the lesson of history? And the Bible, uh, among the many things that it is, it is a lesson of history. And God shows us over and over again the blessings received when we obey him and the punishment received when we don't. And the question is, are we going to learn that lesson and obey or fail to learn it and disobey and suffer because of it? Many people will say things like the children of Israel said, God will never allow us to go into captivity. We're his chosen people. He loves us. God would never allow the temple in Jerusalem to be destroyed. That's his house. But he did both of those things and much more because of their disobedience. Today, the Bible teaches us, as it always has, that there's a day of judgment coming. And the world says, don't be silly. That's not going to happen. 
They tell us that God's not going to destroy the world. Jesus is not going to come back. It's just a story or a myth. They say God is a God of love. He could never punish someone with eternal punishment in hell. How can God do that? And they do everything they can to convince us that it's not going to happen. But just like God's promises to the children of Israel, he absolutely meant every word that he said. And Peter tells us it's still true today. He says in 2 Peter 3, verse 3, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking in their, uh, after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So God said Jesus is coming back, but it hasn't happened. So it's not going to happen. It's interesting the language that he uses there that they would argue that everything continues as it has from the beginning of the creation, which is literally the argument of so-called science today, that things just always happen the way that they have. And so if erosion is taking place at a certain you know, uh, speed right now, then it always has to have been that way. Therefore, the earth must be billions of years old. Well, that ignores something that Peter talks about here. All things don't continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Because he says, for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. So you watch a documentary on the Grand Canyon, or if you go out there and visit it, You'll hear all these things about how the Colorado River slowly eroded all of this dirt over millions of years. That's a great story. It's just not true because there was this thing called the flood. And the Grand Canyon wasn't formed over millions of years. It was formed very quickly in the aftermath of the flood. And it's evidence and testimony of the flood of God. Yet we live in a world where people look at that evidence and say, can't be God. It can't be that the Bible is true. There has to be some kind of naturalistic explanation. And what they mean is Jesus is not coming back. Don't worry about it. That's ultimately the hope of that whole theory that there is no God and we don't have to worry about being judged. But he is coming back because God's word is true. Peter says the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Peter says the reason Jesus hasn't come back yet is because God is being patient and long-suffering and giving man time and opportunity to repent. But that doesn't mean he's forgotten his promise. In fact, Peter says in verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That absolutely is going to happen just like Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed and God's people went into captivity just like God destroyed the world with a flood of waters. It's just as true that one day Jesus is coming back and this world will be destroyed. And when that happens, we're going to stand before him and either be saved eternally or lost forever, either in heaven or in hell. And so what Zechariah says to them, he says to us also, will we learn the lesson to take God at his word and obey, or will we disobey, not listen, and suffer the punishment? The choice is ours. We talked about tonight how the return from captivity was, was voluntary. Nobody forced them to come back home. They had to choose it. It was individual. You didn't just get to come back because your family came. You had to decide to leave and to come back. And that's still true today. Salvation is available to everyone. We can be ready for the return of Jesus but I have to make that choice for myself. You have to make it for yourself. And if we'll choose to listen to God and obey his will, we'll be ready. So if you need to do that tonight in a public way to obey the gospel, put on Christ in baptism, if you've heard and you believe in Jesus, you're willing to repent of your sins, to turn to God, and he will turn to you, confess your faith in Christ, then you're ready for baptism. 
we can help you do that tonight. If you've done that and haven't been faithful and need to come back home, need to go back to God's way and do things God's way and obey his will, then confess your wrongs, repent of them, and pray for forgiveness. We'll pray with and for you. God longs to forgive and to restore. If we can help you with that tonight, why not come forward as we stand and as we sing? Would you live for Jesus' name?